Hi, welcome back. Oh shit, I can hear myself. Well, that's lovely. Everybody who still has the headset on set to channel 7 or 9, please go check yourself, because that's completely wrong. Um, you, can, you can listen to this without headsets nowadays. Uh, it is my, uh, my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Austin Wintry and Robin Hudeke. Uh, who knows, who doesn't know who these people are? Yeah. Everybody, sort of, except for three or four people. Uh, they worked on this, they, oh, I, you don't know? No. Uh, they worked on this thing called the Journey, which is, you might have heard of it. Um, and they are starting a collaboration called Phenomena. Um, this is actually, if I'm not mistaken, the very first time you're doing a talk together, isn't it? Like sound. There we go. Yes, that's true. Is mine on? Yes. yes. Lovely. So, without further technical difficulties, uh, Robin Hunike and Austin. We never met prior to today, so yeah, this will be awkward. <laughs> Can you hear us okay? Now you are re-acclimating to not listening in these uh, like United Nations uh, translator things. Okay, so some of you, some of you already know uh, Austin and I both worked on a game called Journey. It came out on the PSN. Uh, it took three years to make, and uh, we iterated a ton on the game. It was a very experimental process. Three years of prototypes, testing, and throwing stuff away until we found the game that we were looking for. And uh, it was a challenging but ultimately totally rewarding experience that generated both commercial and critical success for our entire team. Journey won several awards at the 2012 VGAs, the DICE Awards, uh, the BAFTAs, and even won a game of the year at this year's game developer choice awards. Yeah. No? Oh, yeah, okay. Shall we switch you Hold to... on. There they go. Good? Yeah! All right. So, so just start. Sorry about that. Yeah, all right. So, so yeah, Journey won a lot of awards. <laughs> um, and we were really excited about that. It was really, it was really amazing, and we're still sort of uh, recovering from it. If you are interested in hearing more about Journey, I gave a very heartfelt postmortem about the game's development called The Long Journey at GC Europe and it's available for free on the GEC Vault website. Uh, and Genova just gave an amazing talk called Designing Journey, which collapsed a bunch of the pitch uh, documents and talks that we gave over the course of developing Journey, and it's really beautiful. I highly recommend it as well, also up on the GEC website. Um, but in this talk, we wanted to focus on a specific aspect of iteration in experimental games, and that is what you hear. So I'm going to play a clip right now for you. Uh, just to give you an example of what we're going to be talking about. Okay. We are connected. Okay, we are connected with Google. Austin Wintory, so journey, session one.
to leave that last part in there. <laughs> Let's try to shut it off before that comes in. So um, the thing that we really want to talk about today is specifically the interaction between game design and game composition. And Austin and I are really going to be giving sort of an informal talk um, about these two things. So I wanted Austin to sort of talk a little bit about that clip um, and give you a context for when that happened and where we were when we first started working together. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to kind of cover this as we go, but just to give you some perspective, that was, that was obviously a trailer uh, for the, the eminently to be released game. And so you're seeing footage of the orchestra you know, recording the music and a guy that I think probably a lot of people on the internet think is me conducting <laughs> the orchestra. Um, and, uh, and, but that was made you know, at the very, very end. And it, was the, it, was, it represented the, the last stage of a three-year process. Uh, composers are often, and we're going to address this, but composers are often brought in rather, thank you. Composers are often brought in rather uh, late, in my opinion, uh, in game design. And uh, in the case of Journey, it ended up being kind of an unintentional case study of what you can do if you start from day one. And so, We'll, we'll get there uh, shortly, but you'll see that, that this, was, this was not um, the inevitable arrival point. It was a very circuitous path to arrive at what you just saw. Yeah. But it was wonderful. You know, Genova and I and uh, Kelly and, and that game company had known each other from Flow years earlier, if anyone here is familiar with Flow as well, and PS3. And so it was a very natural and wonderful thing to be able to dive back in and be comfortable knowing each other and trusting each other and challenging each other. No, really. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so when, uh, when Austin and I met, um, I had actually just uh, come into that game company. I had been previously working at Electronic Arts. Uh, I worked on The Sims and I worked on Boomblocks and both those games were, uh, I did a game for, the, two games for the Nintendo Wii. Um, and by the time that I reached uh, that game company, I had been participating in an experimental game workshop, teaching the MDA framework, and being a voice for independent and student developers for a very long time. And I really believe that the mission of independent games is to push games in a, in a direction that larger corporate uh, development teams often can't because of the risk because of the, you know, the, the sort of overhead associated with those development teams. And I was tired of having to push against that myself. So when they invited me on to the team, originally to be the lead designer, and then eventually I, I realized it was better if I was the executive producer because there were many designers on the team, um, I just couldn't say no. Um, and I think it, it's, it's very fair to say that uh, we both really loved the game when we first heard the pitch. Um, when Genova asked me to work on the game, I had just come back from a trip hiking in the Himalayas to, in Bhutan. Um, where I had summited a 16.5 peak, which was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. And it just immediately was like, yes, I was on the planet to make this game. Um, what was the first thing that happened when he uh, pitched the game to you? Oh, I felt the same way. You know, I've been a gamer a lot longer than I've been a composer. And so as soon as he described the game, I thought, if you pull this off, you will be making the game I've been dreaming my whole life to play. To work on it is like a whole other level of surreal craziness. Uh, and, um, and, uh, because, yeah, he, and what was amazing was the simplicity of Genova's initial pitch, which, you know, we had, Flower had just come out. I didn't work on Flower, but, you know, we're friends. I had been, I had, you know, play tested and been kind of on the sidelines, just enjoying watching their brilliance on that game. And then, uh, like a day after it came out virtually, Genova <laughs> said, okay, we're getting ready to start a new game. You know, let's go to dinner. I want to tell you about it. And then, uh, Genova's the kind of guy, he never engages in small talk or anything. He'll never like sit there and be like, well, it's nice weather today, right? He never has a, every conversation with him is like this intense spiritual yeah. convocation. And so um, I don't know why I expected us to have just this pleasant dinner because of five minutes into it, I was like, I can't believe I didn't bring a notepad. <laughs> and so I had the waitress print off all this receipt paper so I could re be taking notes on what ended up looking quite a lot like a journey scarf, uh, <laughs> uh, coincidentally. Um, and, uh, and because Genova basically said, I want to make a game that captures the archetypes of the hero's journey, which basically is a summary of the entire human experience yeah. in a game that's all done through visual and musical metaphor. And um, basically was yeah, like, where do I sign? <laughs> yeah. So um, on that first you know, part of sort of thinking about journey myself, I realized that 
Um, it wasn't just that it was a few small ideas that added up to something that was much bigger than the small ideas. Um, Journey was a, a fundamental uh, innovation. There was an idea at the very center of it um, that made it really compelling. And this was the idea um, that everything else would support, the story, the art, um, everything went around this idea of connecting two people together um, in, a, in a unique way, in an online context where they felt a genuine human connection with another person. And this feeling was so compelling to me because I believe that games have the opportunity to increase the peace and make us all more uh, in love with one another in a way that really heals us as, as a people. Um, I just could not think of anything I would rather spend the next few years doing, even though at the time it was only supposed to be a year and a half. <laughs> So, um, so this talk is about what happened as a result of those things. So the first thing that we did was we spent about a year sketching out the world of Journey, building out the levels and figuring out um, kind of how it should look and how it should sound. Um, and so the first thing that we did was we built an, a 2D prototype, and Genova and I have talked about it um, a bunch, but uh, we called it Dragon. It had all these features in it. You could uh, move around in the sand, you could shout at one another, uh, you could collaborate to climb things together, uh, you could collaborate to move more quickly in the space. Uh, there were monsters that you had to avoid. There were even pits, which you could fall into or you could push other people into, which we found out was a very common popular pastime. Uh, so uh, there were a lot of things that we realized just with this initial prototype, but and most importantly that it made people have feelings of wanting to stick together and work together to solve problems. Um, but that wasn't really what we could pitch, you know, on the PS3. It was a top-down 2D, you know, prototype made in Flash. And so we had to move to the, to the PS3. And so uh, we ended up working on some really basic stuff because we'd never actually had, for example, a bipedal character animated in a game. <laughs> They're just um, loving this. Yeah, they love it so much. Um, and, the, and one of our goals, really, at this point, was to give both Austin and Steve Johnson, who was our sound designer, something to actually look at, uh, to, to not just be still pictures, but to move through, uh, to give the world some space. And um, even when it was very awkward, when the character had two arms and was kind of praying at the cloth and stuff, it was very, very basic. We felt like we could get a sense of scale in the world. We could build out a sense of the majesty of the mountain. I mean, you can tell that we didn't do a very good job in the very beginning. That's the mountain way in the back there, that little tiny thing. Um, it was very far away, but it wasn't very majestic. So um, we were really trying to build out this world, and you can see Journey was not a very beautiful game, uh, you know, four, eight, four months into development. Um, but it was about um, trying to come up with a way to communicate this feeling. And so um, we ended up getting to a place where we were able to put together a pitch trailer so now I want you to think about what you just saw and now watch this. this well, is, yeah, I'll you, you preface give it a little, this a little, a little bit before here. you play it, which was, um, so Genova and I had that very, very first conversation, which was before anything that she just showed you existed. There was not even concept art yet. It no. was literally just no. like an elevator pitch for no. the game where he said, here's the kind of experience I want to make. And he had the narrative notion which was just the Joseph Campbell hero's journey. If you haven't read Hero of a Thousand Faces, go read it. It's life-changing. Um, and, uh, and uh, or maybe life-defining is uh, more accurate. But, um, and then, you know, he knew about what Robin just said of the priority being to create meaningful interpersonal connections between two players. And so Genova basically just said, so go write a piece of music that sounds like that. Um, and this was on the first day, before I had any sense of, of the feel of the game, and uh, even those top-down 2D prototypes, uh, I, hadn't, I think that they may have existed, but I, hadn't, I played them only after this. And so, um, but to the point Robin made about the fundamental core concept being strong, and it not just being this synthesis of several ideas, but actually itself one really evocative concept. Remarkably, with as little as I had to work with, it was quite easy to come up with a piece of music because it just, it, I was truly, rawly inspired. And so I went that same day to my office. Genova and I sat down at the, at, you know, his office, or it was at Sony Santa Monica. He said, go write this piece of music. You know, we want it to have a lonesome quality, but a beautiful quality. It should feel uh, it should feel like a sense of awe and wonder, but not in some like Hollywood epic kind of sense, but just in a sense that that finds beauty in being alone and, and, and the sort of lonesomeness of that. And 
Um, and, it, and it hit me. By the time I got to my car, I actually knew exactly. I left myself this super weird voicemail where I was like <laughs> singing, like, okay, start with a cello and this. And I, and I just sort of had it in mind. I called this cellist who I find to be just an infinite source of inspiration for me named Tina Guo. And I said, can you meet me at the studio? And like, I need, yeah. I need 45 <laughs> minutes to get back there and then I'll need another 30 minutes to actually write this down so you can play it. So in you know, an hour and a half or whatever, you know, give or take, meet me at the studio and she came and um, I wrote this piece of music, you know, three years before the, the trailer you just watched and then they were able to make this. So this is what was presented. This is what was presented to Sony. Yeah, this is the green light trailer that got Journey uh, funding to be made. that particular piece of music is that it held throughout the entire production. It was like a really solid uh, anchor for us and it created such a tone. If you look at the trailer, you can see, I think, the concepts of Journey, the idea of these people meeting and these things that are larger than them and being overwhelmed by the scale of nature. But the thing that is so constant in between the, the final trailer and that is that feeling of that sweetness and the loneliness mixed together. And I think that without that cello, I don't know that it could have happened. It's very strange to me. Uh, I'm used to being my own worst critic and just harshly rewriting my own material a lot. And it's not only did this get uh, no real revision, um, that actual recording that I made that day is still like what's like if you open up the game on the cross media bar That's you okay. hear that exact piece of music and it's the first track on the soundtrack album and it's the exact same performance from that day so it's it's funny because we recorded the live orchestra which you, which comes in at the end and which initially was fake you know using my computer uh, and uh, and it's funny because you have an orchestra backing up a cello but there's two and a half years of time between the two performances <laughs> Uh, because it just never changed. So a lot of things did change over the course of Journey. Um, and the music and the pieces that Austin was writing during the time that we were iterating through the first, say, nine months of development were really intertwined with the development itself. Um, we were developing the look of the character, an animation set for the character. This is actually a fake cloth character with a real cloth scarf. Um, it kind of looked like a little animating kite. Um, we were working on the sexy HUD that we had to, to profile the game, very important feature. Um, we put in some sand deformation uh, tests, those are little blocks that the character would poop out to show you a trail so that we could see how long the trail could be in the game and before it crapped out the uh, SPUs. Um, we did lighting and particle systems to sort of fill the game in with ambiance um, and built a bunch of internal and external environments to try and see how we could make the game feel cool when you were inside as well as outside. Um, and some of these things were completely removed when we moved forward. I mean, these are things that, this is a sort of a weird spaceship, space needle thing that was going to be in the game maybe that we never used. Um, uh, there are a lot of things that we developed along the way. Um, and as we were doing that, um, Austin and Steve were working on movements 
in the soundtrack and also sound effects, um, playing the builds, uh, writing builds, coming by the studio, and um, giving us feedback while we also conducted field tests. So we would have people come in and play the game um, pretty regularly. By the by, the you know by by October of 2009, we had people coming in at least every uh, every two weeks and sometimes every other week to play the game. Um, and I think it's fair to say that um, during this time. Uh, Austin was kind of using the game's compositions and colors to inspire the music, and Steve was sort of using the mechanics to inspire the sound. Um, and I just thought you might want to talk a little bit about that process. In fact, we have a... It, it, was, a, it was a bit strange uh, in hindsight, though it always felt normal at the time. But basically, they would show me, you know, like a, you know, um, an area of the game like this, um, and say, okay, here's kind of the emotion that we're after. But also, I would just play it and develop my own emotional... Because, you know, I had a test kit, so I could play test it back in my studio, and I would play it over and over. In fact, the other day, I was like, I can't prove this, but I think I've probably played Journey more than any other person on planet Earth. Because I played it almost seven days a week for three years before it ever even came out. So I had a huge advantage uh, in time. And, uh, and because I would just sit there and test it, to, to, to see how it would make me feel, and then i just try to capture that in music. But then what would be really interesting is I would then send that piece of music to the team, and they'd put it in, and I'd get this feedback that's like, oh, this helps really clarify yep. how this feels, because they would react to the music, and then they'd feel like the music is capturing better than the gameplay is what we want it to be, which was strange to me because the music was inspired by the gameplay. So they'd say, oh, we need to make the gameplay better to try to catch up with the music. So they'd go and make all these improvements to the gameplay, which I would then go and play and be like, oh, well, that music has nothing to do with this. That's crap. This is amazing. So I'd rewrite the music and they'd say, ooh, this music really tells us what the gameplay is supposed to be. And we were in this like weird it was perpetual like an arms loop. Race. <laughs> yeah, an arms race. Uh, but, you know, which we'd still be doing if finally Sony hadn't stepped in and said, okay, we're releasing it now. <laughs> exactly. I think Austin actually said when we were preparing for the talk that he would be happy to be still working on Journey right now. <laughs> oh, I love so it. Yeah, you're lucky, that, you're lucky that they made a stop. <laughs> so a lot of times we would have things like a, a sketch. So at the very beginning of the game development, we talked about all these mechanics we wanted to get into the game. And, uh, you know, um, just as Austin had sort of his images of what the music would be like, I had these, you know, lists and lists and lists of features and was trying to kind of coordinate the team and get everybody on the same page. And one of the things we developed very early was this struggle, this idea of struggling against the wind. And there was a really cool uh, sort of uh, synergy that happened with this particular uh, mechanic uh, in that you were working on the music for this, right? You were actually prototyping a lot of the sounds in music and ended up coming up with the concept here. Well, yeah, it was interesting because um, so much, like, not to get all kind of new agey on you, but <laughs> in the game, cloth is sort of, is life. Yeah. You know, you are made of cloth, the other creatures in the world are made of cloth, and the game never really uh, tries to specify or answer the question of like, is that a person wrapped up in cloth or are they just made of cloth? There is, no, there is no answer to that. It's whatever you choose for to, to mean. But, but bottom line, the takeaway is that sort of life force is in this threaded, woven medium. And so... And you're supposed to respect it. There was a huge amount of discussion about having to build a world in which you felt a real kind of veneration for that life. Yeah, it should feel rare. important and sacred in the way yeah. that we would, you know, like certain cultures would, re would revere nature. We were wanting nature to take the form of cloth entities. And so um, one way to do that is because there's no dialogue and there's no sort of audio outside of the music and the sound design is that those needed to be really <laughs> interwoven with, uh, <laughs> the, um, with the interaction with the cloth. And so that went through a lot of different iterations and tests and ideas and we'll touch base on some of that as we go. But, but point being is that I was constantly involved, even though I'm not really a sound designer, I was constantly involved in creating sound prototypes because they had to be able to mesh with the music I was writing. And so this screenshot here is a perfect example where um, Matt, presumably, yeah. made, Matt Nava, the art director, made these stones that you're supposed to hide behind when there's yeah. wind howling. And he put like a circle gap. It's in like them. a snake that's actually wrapped on itself and where the head comes around to the front there's like a hole where the neck is open so there's a hole right Yeah, almost top. as if like, like my body, eye. my neck like went up and then my head came and folded back down and made almost like a giant sewing needle. Yeah. Um, and so we were looking at that and we're like, well wind would blast through that. And so we started saying, well wouldn't it be cool if that whistled? 
And like, so then I started prototyping whistles that would sound through this, th and it was like, it had no, it had, it had no functionality in the game, and it, it didn't like, because initially I thought, well, what if, you know, the, the player sings into it and it's like an amplifier and we yeah. build this whole gameplay thing out of it and I would get these quiet, like, no, no, we're not, <laughs> that's not, that's, that's a very bad idea, but... Um, but it did end up becoming something that we used to position the wind, so when you were walking through the corridor, this shot was taken from a version of the prototype where there was a wide angle and you would see the character moving along sideways, but in the final version, the character's moving headlong into this field of, of whistle stones and you can tell when the wind is going to come down the corridor because you can hear the whistling starting very faintly away from you and then it comes forward. So it ended up actually being that Nick and Matt were very inspired by this and built it into the gameplay. Again, a situation where the creative arms race between the sound designers and the designers um, came out with this really great mechanic. Yeah, and, and, you know, and I knew what the pitch center, it's not really traditional music that's in a key, but it was a, there was a pitch center to the music, which as it turns out in this case was E, and so, I remember Steve Johnson went and got an old glass Coke bottle and was literally, like, you know, blowing over the top of it and got an E to come out of that so that it's actually pitched with the music in a way that it, it just, it sounds like it was done on purpose, which obviously it was. It doesn't, it doesn't just sound like random noise. So, you know, I think as a, you know, as a design takeaway for this part of the talk, there were things in the game that didn't end up working out. We had dual scarves to show XP. We had um, this mechanic for uh, a shelter uh, where you could go into the shelter, but only one person could stay in it, or if both people didn't get to it in time, they would be blown away. We had some really big snowstorms that came through and sandstorms that came through the level. These things got cut away, but... Um, Emotionally, they're still present in the soundtrack because Austin was affected by playing these things and then integrating those concepts into the music, which was really critical. Yeah, like for example, with the shelter specifically, there was a, early on there was a sandstorm. This is in the mountain in the snow, but earlier in principle, there was a similar moment where this giant like tidal wave of a sandstorm would come blowing through the <laughs> desert, and if you weren't in shelter, it would blow you away, and it, the whole thing was really not working and it was stupid and we, we got rid of it but but I always liked the feeling of when I would crouch in the shelter with somebody because especially if you barely made it on time there was a definite like emotional reaction from that and and so later on in the game there were these moments in the mountain where you could kind of take shelter and even though there wasn't an inherent benefit to doing so I remembered that emotional feeling so in the game like if you guys go back and play it again you'll notice that the music always changes into something kind of warm and beautiful when you take shelter on the mountain to, to, to keep pace with, with just the notion of what you're doing, you know? Because I always wanted to make sure that dynamically the music always was with you and was, and, 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 and that, so, so that you were almost like the musical director unknowingly throughout the yeah, game. Yeah, so this concept of like an oasis is the way you described it. Like there's an oasis point in the music when you have shelter. And um, that came from this mechanic, even though the mechanic didn't actually make it into the game. So, you know, I think it would be, it would be very easy for someone to say, oh, well, you guys wasted a lot of time, but maybe we didn't use everything that we made, but everything that we made affected what we made. And so it was, yeah. worth, it was worth the time. The worst know? case outcome of what we did was that there's a more emotionally rich experience, even though it's, a, it's sort of an ancestral descendant of a mechanic that's not actually in the game anymore. Because I'm in there from day one, I'm able to see what they're doing, think that it's really inspiring, write music that is informed by that, and then even as the individual mechanics change, you end up with something that's still emotionally rich. And if I had been brought in much later as per the more traditional musical model, there would have just, there would have just been like, you know, little rooms that I would have just rock, walked right by. They would have had no significance to me, and so I wouldn't have thought to treat them musically um, in any sort of special way. Yeah, so as we were trying to kind of create this relationship to the game ourselves as developers, Austin was on that journey with us. And I think this is something that when you try to describe someone in an experimental gameplay process, uh, it's very hard for people to understand. Like when you say things like we were trying to refine the movement and communicate the backstory, what you're really saying is you're trying to create a relationship between the team and the concepts in the game so that it makes sense. So yes, the character has a name symbol, and yes, they can harmonize with cloth. But when you think about it, even the word harmonize, which is the word that we use on the team to describe this, is a musically inspired concept. And Austin's sound prototypes that were musical 
influenced the way we thought about the cloth, the weaving of the cloth, the unweaving of the cloth, the creation of these characters, the sand, everything about the world revolves around these musical concepts. So in a way, the game is musical because we thought about it sonically and as a, as a musical experience, as a directed experience by the player all the time. Yeah, music sort of drives the narrative. It's almost like an interactive ballet uh, because it's, it's uh, informing you overwhelmingly through the music which is both really exciting and of course really hugely terrifying because I'm like, wow, there's an entire team of people that are de like brilliant in making this game and somehow I end up being like the leading edge messenger for a lot of what they're trying to communicate. So it was one of those things like, thank God I had a lot of time because I'm nowhere near smart or creative enough to figure out any of this crap unless I had years to do it. <laughs> uh, Austin is, 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 is far, too, uh, far too humble. But I will say that one of the things that, that I felt at this time was that if you look at the game, if you look at these screenshots, you can see that we were trying to get at this notion of scale and distance, um, but the game itself was kind of flat. We were using a super flat style, which I actually really liked. I mean, I still love these like sort of Zelda-esque clouds. Um, but the levels didn't have the lighting and the particles and all the things that we ended up adding later. They didn't have the depth. And I felt at the time that the music, when, when new builds would come in with the music, when Genova would implement the music, and I would get to sit down late at night after everybody else had left and play through with new sounds, it would always round out the experience for me and warm the world, give it more tone, give it more balance in a way that we just weren't hitting it with the visuals yet or with most of the mechanics. Everything was so blocky and flat and awkward um, and half the game couldn't even be played. It was broken all the time. And when you would get a, a new piece of music, it would give me the faith that we could push through that to live up to that potential, like Austin was saying. So in a way, it was really leading us and inspiring us. And the irony... Really, yeah, yeah, which is really funny because I had the exact opposite view where everything they did I thought was mind-blowing and super brilliant and I also felt like I could intuitively sense the trajectory of it. Like if they showed me, if, if it was going to take five steps of iteration to get somewhere and they showed me step one, I would just kind of see the fifth step because I'd seen them with Flower and with Flow um, get to that final piece that was wonderful and so I would see something like this and I would kind of not really see it, I would see what I know they want it to eventually be. And so I would write music that was hopefully aimed at what it would eventually be, except then I would feel like that music doesn't live up to that at all. And so she's sitting there playing the game like, wow, this music is so completing the game. And I'm sitting there like, oh my god, this music is really holding the game back. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was, you know, just everything was this constant, uh, I'm going to keep using that arms race. Yeah, That's but at the same to... time it was a dialogue. And I think that, you know, polishing the technical part of the game, working on the narrative, and like doing usability tests, these were things that by the end of that first year we really needed to do because we had a lot of ideas and we hadn't really decided what journey was yet. Um, we were getting very close to the end of our prototype period and the prototypes were still happening very rapidly. Um, the movement up the cloth was really janky. Uh, you know, there, were, there was constant interpenetration with the cloth so the character's feet were always sticking out and looked really, the character looked really dorky. This is a different version of the character that we had. We were moving through iterations on the animation cycles and stuff. Um, but I really believe that um, during this time that we, were, that we were just very much cramming stuff into the game and just trying whatever we could, um, we were shaping users' expectations both with the sound and the mechanics in a way that was, was really crucial. So that even as the world started to get juicier and more rounded out, you can see that by the end of, of 2009, we had started to add some texture to the air and we were giving you better visual cues. There was more distance uh, and more depth to the world. Um, it was actually, um, it was becoming more of a place and you were able to use the music to draw people in, right? And this was also the first time where initially, you know, when you're prototyping, I would just try to create broad swaths of music. So I would say, okay, this, this, here's a, here's a five minute loop that we're just gonna slug awkwardly into the game that's gonna be, we would refer to them as overtures, where mm -hmm. it basically is just gonna try to summarize this whole huge chunk of the game. But it's never, ever, ever intended to be the Perfect. final music. Um, because to me, highly interactive music is always better. <laughs> and so it was only at this stage that I was able to start finally carving up the game into sections and saying, okay, like, you know, if in this screenshot where the player is standing 
at the moment of this screenshot will have a certain musical feel, but like you can see there's a little building in the distance there that they're aimed at. I want, I want the music to acknowledge and accompany their arrival to that building. And it was only after that first year or so that we were confident enough in the basic emotional landscape, and really only of the first half of the game anyway, that I could start then carving up the music and getting more and more detail. Because if I were to spend all that time doing that in the initial stage, that really would actually probably be a waste of, of time and sort of mental bandwidth because yeah. so much was changing so fast that to be doing fine needlework when your, your canvas is being switched in and out doesn't make sense. And we're finally, after years, kind of getting to that phase. Yeah, and I actually felt that like the music at this point started to, because it was leading you places, it started to become part of the mystery of the game. So we started to add secrets, and we started to add um, cutscenes and narrative to the game. Some of the very first animatics went into the game at this time to make the world sound like we were slowly beginning to make it look and feel. And so um, I'm just going to play this clip here, um, and then Austin can talk a little bit about, about this concept of the overtures. changed a lot, again, because I was shoulder to shoulder with the team the whole time, um, the broad, like, philosophical conceptions of the music were able to stay the same. So, like, the piece that you just heard, very simple, it was initially written for a visual sequence that you're seeing here that's not in the game anymore. It, it had sort of descendants that resembled it, but it was, I was able to start figuring out like what are my, what's the palette? So like that instrument that you just heard as sort of the lead is called bass flute. It's like a normal flute that you would see playing in an orchestra, except it, it's the, 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 yeah, the bigger, lower cousin of, the, of it. And I, and, I, and I just felt intuitively that it seemed to kind of evoke this character, this larger character in the white uh, cloth that you have these interactions with in the game. And so I was able to, I kind of assigned that instrument to that character so that at any point in the game, if ever you hear that instrument, it's, it's um, the way I thought of it. Whether, whether a player takes this away or not is, is up to them, and I don't have any agenda. But my goal was always that it feel like you're kind of in dialogue with this sort, of, this sort of spiritual nature of the world. And I got that because of these sort of moments which I refer to as like the, the confluences uh, with kind of your ancestral past. And uh, so, you know, that was one of those ideas that we hashed out, even though the particulars that you see here of how that came to be yeah, are actually, long gone. <laughs> the, this last panel here on the lower right, um, Matt would uh, affectionately refer to that as the ancestor vomiting on the character in <laughs> yeah. their own name. It was supposed to be that you were being given your name, and it, it was this like weird spew of particles that came out of the character's mouth, and it was like a big joke on the team for a long time. But the music, again, was serious, even though we were taking the piss out of our own work and like kind of beating ourselves up about how much love there was to do, the feeling was there, which was really guiding us. And then there was... Um, I think I'm just a softie. Like, I would... Yeah. Look, I would, I, I would <laughs> I'm a romantic, because I would look at that, and while they're like, oh my god, he's vomiting symbols all over the player, I'm like, it's beautiful! <laughs> <laughs> so I apparently was just well cast for this game. <laughs> We also were always, were always looking at it um, with, with, the, with an eye to improving it, like this uh, shout symbol, which, I mean, anyone that was on the team will, will attest, I was constantly asking when we were going to replace this uh, temporary bubble that was in the game with something real. It just looked like this weird, I don't know, what did you call it? It's the like, Magneto, the Magneto uh, bubble. <laughs> um, and it, it was in the game for a very, very long time. Um, but it was in because we were really experimenting with the way that players called with each other, so we had a bunch of ideas for developing s prototypes for players to call to each other. There was one where you could move the joystick while calling and it would pitch blend the... Yeah, we had a just lot of different ideas about the communication system because that was one of those things that needed to dovetail with the score, but yet needed to stand distinct from the score. And, and it was always a balancing act of, should it be driving the music or should you be like trying to kind of integrate yourself naturally within the music yeah, totally um, and all done in an unconscious way and in a way that feels organically communicative with the other player because the, there is no like voice over IP or you know, uh, uh, ch you know some kind of chat system or text or anything like that so these shouts were going to be the only way that you communicate with the other player 
And so if it was just randomly generated sound, it was very harsh and sounded awful. And so I thought, well, but it'd be great if this emergent language could be formed. And so we tried all sorts of wacky experiments where like if you tilted one of the, the, the sticks on the controller, it would pitch the sound higher or lower so you could kind of control it. But of course, one hour of iterating on that <laughs> prototype and the players are all like, <laughs> it sounds totally bizarre. It totally and took you out of the game. Yeah, it, it really absolutely ruined awkward. the experience. And so we had to try to bury the mechanics. And I tried things where like we created a compass system where I, I would define what north was. And, and if north was the goal and you faced south, the shouts would be different as a way to try to suggest like maybe turn around. And yeah. it, either, it either was totally unnoticeable or it was super obvious and annoying. And, so we you know, worked through a lot of very inorganic systems before arriving at the system that's in there now, where it's, you know, it's, it's pitch sets that are always very relative to what's happening in the music, but then there's also two separate pitch sets, one for player one and one for player two. So like what you hear on your computer, at, or on your, out of your PlayStation, rather through your speakers at home, is always the same. The player on the other end is hearing that same set of sounds, and they hear you differently, and that ended up letting us hit everything we were trying to hit but in a way that's very transparent and, you know it's like the way i like to think of it is if you go to a magic show and you see the guy how he's doing the trick if you see like the guy pulling the ace out of his sleeve it's really not a trick anymore and so it has to be a completely transparent system yeah we ended up actually sort of coming up with a grid that you know i remember drawing in my notebook this grid it was uh you could um yeah the four emotional chirp. states <laughs> you could coo you could call or you could shout. Those were the four major actions that any player could do. And then we ended up eventually making it sensitive to how hard and how rapidly you were hitting the button. So if you hit the button very rapidly and very hard, you get certain sound versus soft. And it really does, when you're playing, you naturally start, when you're shouting, you really are pressing very hard on the controller and you're also holding down the button because you're panicked usually when you're calling. Yeah, it was, just, it was just observing natural human behavior where you're like, well, you just, we would play test someone and you, know, you have a camera watching the play tester and when they're really urgent, you see the see way that they're, they're, they're doing it and it's like, well, okay, we need to, that needs to be the mechanic that we're tying. So it's very simple, just what's the rate and what's the velocity that they're hitting. Because sometimes someone wanted to say, come here, come here, come here, come here, but they weren't mad. And so they would be hitting the button really gingerly and really softly, but rapidly. And so it's like, okay, that's one thing. And then if they're holding down and charging up this thing. So it was just actually observing what the play tests were telling us and but building the system. Also around. part of this constant dialogue about what, you know, what the sound could do for us and how we could make the sound you know, more integral. So for the next year, we made lower progress on larger sets of things. So we just went through a ton of slides, which was all the basic mechanics. And then in 2010, basically, we were building out the world and really trying to figure out if we could use those same mechanics that we liked from the first year of progress um, in, in the game itself. And this is actually um, one of my favorite pictures from Journey. It's, um, it's the terrain of Journey represented as uh, both uh, the literal time scale that you play the game in, so starting off at the very beginning and then all the way to the end. It's also the depth of the game, and it's also the emotional curve of the game. So there's actually a method to the entire uh, document. It's, uh, I think, one of the most beautiful ways of expressing how Journey feels. Um, and there are three clips here, so I'm just going to yeah, let uh, mu Austin musically. Um I really wanted to make sure that the macro arc was captured. Um, and so, like this music from the very opening of the game, you hear is almost over, almost entirely electronic, with little interstitial instrumental solos, like the bass flute I mentioned, and then the cello solo. Like, that's the bass flute right there. Um, and it's very primordial, you know? It feels, it feels very basic and simple. And then as you progress into the game, like this next clip here is, um, uh, from that uh, underground sort of cave area where um, you'll hear the, it becomes more traditionally orchestral uh, and a little bit more sort of instrumental by nature as an emergent property. Like I didn't want the game to just feel like it's electronic music from start to finish, but nor should it feel like it's orchestral music from start to finish because you can see looking here at the scope of the whole game from start to finish, there's supposed to be a really defined sense of progression so too there had to be in the music, so that like, and, and, the, and that's just simple storytelling, because if you then go to the third uh, bit, this is, you know, from the big sort of grand finale of the game. This music, I don't think would have any emotional impact if the whole game had sounded like this. But when most players get to this, it feels very emotionally cathartic, and it's because they've been 
set up that way. You know, having an arc that spans the entire game instead of just a series of pieces of music that work for that individual moment is really important. Everything has to do both. The music has to capture what I'm doing right now, but how right now figures within the entire journey. Yeah, and we actually could feel it as the music was coming along. You could tell that it was getting more and more related to the physical environments that we were developing. So, you know, even as the dev team was working on these core features, like the cloth character prototype, which we put in halfway through the second year of development, um, when we were supposed to be done with the game, um, and uh, the sand shaders, HDR lighting, MLA, all these features that were graphics features that gave the world its softness and, and let Matt and John work together to create this really beautiful painterly look. Um, we were giving the world all the sparkle and working on the design of the terrain, sculpting the terrain. The designer spent a lot of time thinking about your movement through the space. We got the sand surfing in and these other features that, that I was actually highly skeptical of at the time and they ended up working out fantastic. Um, bringing the landscape alive with simulation while we were doing all that, Austin was going back through the levels that were developed and really honing in on the feeling of those levels as they were sculpted and even coming to life, becoming more juicy. So these it's, three cues are about that. Yeah, so it's sort of like the way I saw it is my goal was initially to just capture the very basic essence of it and then to try to whittle away everything that I didn't need and, 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 and really try to get it to a place that was deeply intertwined with the gameplay and with the emotional goals that TGC was after. And that it's sort of like you can think of if you imagine like a, like a, a shoreline that's all these craggly rocks, if my goal is to like perfectly capture those rocks, my first draft is like dropping a piece of wood, like a <laughs> wooden plank on top of those. So it's just gonna fall and just sort of sit on top of these rocks. And then the second draft would be like throwing a blanket over where it kind of slightly adheres to the shape. And then the second thing is just like pouring a liquid over it where it's gonna adhere exactly to the shape. And so, but that's a discovery process. So like this first clip is a very early draft of the music from the desert which I hate this piece of music vehemently. Uh, it's horrible, it's like so just, if Journey had had this music in it, I would certainly not be sitting here right now. We used to sort of joke that it was like there was a little dude like running beside you with a little drone hanging out, running beside you just off camera, that you could never catch him, but he was always and there. The whole belly dancing <laughs> mini game. And, yeah, totally wrong, I mean, but it, was, it, it captured the pocket. very yeah. basic notion. So then, but then as like the desert, this is all just the opening desert. These three clips are all music from the, from the opening uh, desert area. And so at some point I started to realize this interaction with the cloth, little creatures all that are almost like schools of birds in the sky, that, once that came online, I suddenly realized this needed to be kind of charming and, and, uh, and sort of childlike and innocent and fun, but sort of serene and solemn in its way. So this piece got us a little closer. You can hear the harp suddenly became important. And then, um, and then here's the final music, which sort of finally is apparently what Journey needed to sound like. And what's great about this particular piece is that it, um, it actually captures when two people are playing together, there are those different uh, flute tones that come out, and they really um, they bring out this romantic sensation that I was saying this to Austin earlier. The desert is one of my favorite areas in the game because it's the first time that you really get to be open with another person. You, you get over your shyness and you, you move into a relationship with them in the way that you do when you first fall in love. And anyone who's fallen in love hard when they're really young, that kind of openness to someone else is something that's really hard to get back. And I, every time I play this level, I feel like I still can remember those really tender, open feelings that we have when we first learn to love another person. Um, this is the part of the game that's about that blossoming into adulthood, and it's so reflected in the music. I feel like it, it always moves me. It was, it was a lot of work. Like, you know, like These are three little milestones, but there's 400 other little <laughs> speaker symbols that I could put in between those three because it was, it was a lot of work to really get, because you know, it was really easy to take what she just said, which I think is this really beautiful and true universal sentiment, and make it something really reductive and cheesy like that. And so, um, it was, it was, uh, I was always striving to, uh, to find a balance. Yeah, I think we were trying to figure out how to respect the player and their actions with the music. And this next clip, which we'll play you a little bit of, um, is from much later in the game, but it shows you, I think, what happens 
when you when you really do it. Um, and Austin can tell you kind of. Yeah, I'll just sort of talk over this yeah. while it goes. But the idea of really, um, like you'll see, you're just watching a, a, a capture of gameplay. Like there's nothing doctored about this footage um, because I always wanted to make sure that the musical experience was wrapped really tightly around the player's experience, so that the music never feels like it's dictating to you, like you're doing it wrong. Um, it should just always be right. But music is a fundamentally linear concept, and gameplay is fundamentally non-linear. So making those two mesh together was the biggest part of what I was focused on for those three years, is to make it actually sound like a piece of music and not be something that sounds like it's being procedurally generated, which to me is a fascinating experiment, but it never feels humanistic to me, which is what the core of what, for me, music is. So like for this moment, which to me the first time this came online, I, dear, I nearly had a heart attack. Um, Matt uh, Nava really outdid himself with this sunset moment. The music needed to change, and you can hear the, the energetic sort of sprightly, innocent youthfulness of the, out of the previous cue gives way very seamlessly to this cue in a way that just feels like a piece of music. You know? It's, 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 you know, intended to be very seamless. Um, but here, in this particular capture, the character is actually dancing on the air a little bit here in a very celebratory way. That's not mandatory. And then they come around this curve here and go right back into the main music. But if you hang out up there, it becomes very quiet. And you can just kind of hang out and look. Yeah, whenever I would play the game, I was so in awe of that yeah. shot in that big archway and just hang that out. I would just sit there sometimes for a long time and so the music will actually just naturally end and you'll just have the sound of wind and then it, it only resumes once you start going but if you go immediately like this player did it also works and um, the game actually works with players who glide in the air as well as those who surf all the way down we had many different versions of the ending of this level and this one really captured I think best that feeling of sudden eclipse so, you know, these, these timings, no matter how you play the game, it'll always time out that way. And that is that part in the diagram from before where you see the, the, it's shading from red to blue. It's happening right in that moment. That's actually like a, a, a visceral experience that we had in the sideways diagram that we wanted to capture. So, you know, we had another year left in development, which we didn't know at the time. Um, and that now the slides get really small. There's only a few slides left because it was taking it much longer to build out um, progress in the game. Um, and what we were really trying to do was figure out um, how could we remove errors in our judgment. We had some bugs in the game. We had a, a particularly bad mechanical problem where players were hoarding cloth from one another because we had designed the cloth uh, collection system at, in a way that encouraged people to compete with each other and it was totally broken. And we were spending a lot of time um, at the beginning of 2011, playtesting the game and freaking out about the fact that these things were broken. And once we fixed that, then we moved on to getting the, the creatures networked. Um, and the game was actually finally built out in a way that you could play through it with another person and have the individual network creatures playing with you so that you could feel the world come alive through your actions in a way that up until this point, I mean, this is May of 2011, so, you know, maybe seven, eight months before we shipped, um, we were really pushing it. And so in this clip, um, I think, represents uh, the achievements that we made once we could really tune all those aspects of the music together. And Austin's going to talk a little bit about the mechanical aspects. Yeah, it was like something I had dreamt of doing from day one was having the music be simultaneously very contextual to your intentions moment by moment. Like in the last clip that you saw, you know, coming around this corner and revealing this beautiful sunset needs to have an emotional accompaniment to it. But um, only once we were starting to zero in on the timeline could I finally bring in this other idea that I'd been fantasizing about for, at that point, you know, two years or whatever, <laughs> of the music dynamically shifting based on the player, the two-player interaction as well. Um, so like here, this uh, music, like this clip you're watching, this is just a clip I pulled off YouTube of, you know, someone who had captured their playthrough uh, of the shipped game. So, um, it got a camera back. <laughs> yeah, and so they, um, these two, uh, these two players, you know, have a very specific kind of way that they're interacting, and I wanted to make sure the music was always reflective of that. So that if two players seem to really engage with each other, the music is actually dynamically readjusting itself in real time 
based on a set of parameters that we created to say, okay, these players seem to be really into each other and seem to actually be meaningfully connected. And so the music is progressively becoming more sort of connected in its own, its own way and unlocking, there's, there's whole instruments. If you play the game 100% start to finish alone and then you play it with someone else as back-to-back -back things, you'll hear, uh, especially certain areas like this, will sound considerably different in each of those playthroughs but hopefully not in obvious ways. Uh, you would, you know, because it's not a concert, you're supposed to be playing a game, and so, you know, it has to be subtle. But uh, point being is that finally, as we were getting towards the end, and these creatures were coming online, and the network code was stable enough that you could actually have like a reliable um, way of gauging two players' experience, and I could actually have variables generated that gave me a sense of like, how long they were at relative proximity to each other and how often they were making physical contact with each other and things like that, I could actually build a musical system that says, okay, if these players uh, are, are spending a lot of time together and seem to really engage with each other, I want the comparative yeah. intimacy of the music to kind of rise and it to be less about adventuring through the desert and more about two people coming together. And actually, at this point, we also, we struggled with this level for a long time because it was very repetitive and it wasn't fun. And we sculpted the terrain, and then we added the creatures, and then it all sort of came together mechanically um, as, I think, the culmination of the process that we'd been engaged in for that whole entire three years. So that by the time that we actually conducted our first online test, which was a few thousand players, the music was blocked out for the whole game, and we had polished it to fit the look and feel of about three quarters of the game. So uh, we had gone through many variations of the character, and we had gone through many variations of the physical versions of the game. If you look at a screenshot from the very beginning of the presentation and the one, the, basically the video that we just saw, it's like night and day. But um, the last levels of the game, particularly the very final one, were just really horrible. And um, did not work. They were the totally broken. Um, and we were now in August of 2011. We were supposed to announce the game and ship in the fall. And it was looking like we were going to have to get another extension. It was a super stressful time for the team. Um, particularly because we knew that we had to nail the landing. Like, you have to nail the landing to get the great marks, you know. We just knew that if we didn't come out on top in the very last level of the game, that the game would be diminished greatly. And yeah, the we last like level that, of the game We were that Olympic gymnast who yeah. flips 5,000 times in the air and does something death-defying, and then they smash and faceplant. Uh, it was so bad. Um, and Austin actually had a friend that came by and was playing the game, and It was it, strange where... where have, froze, you, you've right? all, have you all played the... Have almost all of you played the game? I mean, we don't like to give, like, spoilers. Yeah, we don't want to ruin it for you. But there, there's, you know, obviously a very significant event that happens in the game in the mountain, in the snow, before the f big finale of the game, right? And um, I, my old college roommate happened to be visiting, and he knew about the game and had been announced the previous year at E3, and so he said, you know, how is it going? I'd love to check it out. So I brought him down when I was going down for a meeting anyway with TUC, and he, they put him off, actually it was in your yeah, office, my office. Uh, and he playtested the game in solitude, and at that critical moment in the game, it, right when it fade, fades to white, uh, the system crashed and just stuck on the white screen. And he sat there for like 10 minutes. Blown away. And he felt like he'd had the most profound emotional transformational experience of his entire life. He's and like, he walked out of the room with like really? ghosts in his eyes and he was like, <laughs> guys, this is unbelievable. And we were all like, shit. Well, you actually missed the end of the game. Uh, and so he was like, really? Because this was the best ending I think I've ever seen in a game. It's so emotional. And it was so, he was like, this is so postmodern and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so then we're like, well, why don't you at least see how the ending of the game was? And he played it and it was like, well, you could just feel, it was like watching him. It's like you go watch, you know, like Schindler's List and then you sit down and, 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 and watch like The Hangover. Uh, it was like, you could see the disparity between the two emotional experiences. And we were like, oh my God, the ending of this game is not even close. And we had physical bugs, we had art issues, we, there, was, there were emotional lows that we weren't reaching before emotional highs that were out of place. And the biggest problem was that so we were, we, we, the, the emotional intensity of that scene that you all fear, everyone knows what I'm talking about, right? I'm trying to be very vague yeah. in my language, yeah. but well, those, yeah. who have, those who have played the yeah. game know what I'm talking about is what I, I'm trying to keep it vague for your specific benefit. Yes. You uh, sure. um, uh, the, uh, but you all know what I'm talking about, is this really tumultuous moment that's the turning point before the last, very last segment of the game. And, um, we and we, we wanted, we were, we kept trying to make that moment that came after it bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, and like, 
the game was getting really sort of epic in this very traditional video yeah. gamey kind of way because we were like, it's just not hitting emotionally. We it's actually not had like a, a knight's like disc system that you were flying through, and it was like there was this stream of air, and it was we were trying to force this really. And you could like crash into the yeah, big and, creatures and no, destroy was, them. And was, oh, it was just so intense. And we were completely lost. I mean, we were so stressed out. We were sure it just wasn't big enough. It wasn't big enough. That was the problem. And so, so what, ended, what, what, yeah, yeah, what ended up happening is that there was this um, concert that Austin put together for us like a year and a half earlier, right? It was like it was it was what? a significant period of time. It was it was yeah it was it was no 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 it was it was about it was about parallel because what happened was we while we were struggling or maybe slightly before this before. Um, by unrelated because I have a whole other career as like a conductor and and as a composer writing music for the concert hall and I, this 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 concert came up that I was invited to participate in where they wanted they they, they were interested in they basically just said do whatever you want to do. And so Tina, my amazing cellist from Journey, I thought it'd be fun to write a Journey-inspired sort of miniature cello concerto for her. So it's sort of like variations on the music from Journey, but it's not variations on Journey itself. Like, you can see, like it's scored for a standard full orchestra, which the game is not. Um, and there's obviously no moment in the game that sounds like this, with brass playing the Journey theme and all this. Um, but this was its own thing. It was, like a, it was like an alternate universe version of Journey's music that I put together just for its own sake, called Woven Variations, and you can see this on YouTube. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of skip ahead here. You'll notice the way I decided to end the piece was by getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So we end with just Tina. She's playing way up high for a cello. And so the piece is like contracting, and just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. To me, it was just the way to end that piece. But then meanwhile, it's like I would work on this and then I'd go back into the studio for the game and I'd be trying to get huge and huge and huge. And so by chance, I just happened to premiere this piece while we were kind of struggling with how to make the ending work. And TGC all came to the performance. This was in Los Angeles and, I, and they, all, they all just happened to be in the audience when I was conducting this concert. And um, the next day they called and they were like, we realized like we've been doing this exactly backwards. You and your little tangential experiment actually solved the ending of the game for us. We need to be getting smaller, not bigger. And so I ended up, for those of you that know what I'm talking about, you know that the, like, the solo cello is, is very key to the final moments because we get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and that was a total accident that we discovered that, that they just happened to come to this concert and that, that I had happened to write the piece that way. But that's just that organic development process where, you know, you can, you can do that a, sort of It thing. was a conversation between all of us. Like, Austin was never, you know, in the office as a member of the development team in the traditional sense, but he was with us there every day for the entire project. Like, he's counted in the head count when I say that we were at peak, we were 12 to 15 people. Austin is in that headcount as a developer because he was a, cri a cr critical member of the team. And we don't really talk that much about the end of the game. We don't have a lot of screenshots from development. In fact, we very rarely show footage or anything in the game past uh, the part where you go down into the, into the cave and, and, and see those initial uh, parts where they're blue. We, tr we really try to leave the ending of the game open to interpretation. But for the purpose of the presentation, I will just say that um, the last notes of that solo became very important for us in our creative process. Like I said, we were very stressed out. It was the last month's development. We were really searching for common ground because we wanted to build an ending that would respect many interpretations. We always were trying to respect the player and my ultimate goal was always to bring everyone to the table to a shared vision of what Journey could be and that music created a common ground for us. It grounded the conversation. When we realized we wanted the game to become smaller, we were all sitting together in the conference room and just imagining Matt actually played the music and showed us some of the stuff that he'd been working on and we were like, this is, it's going in the right direction. And it was really the first time in weeks that we had felt hope that we could actually solve the problem because it didn't have to be big. It could end with a whisper. It could end with a kiss. And that was very, very important. Um, to, to Journey, and I think it, um, it, it was... It was not obvious for it was, a long it, time. It was immeasurably important, and yet we couldn't have found it if we hadn't been working together for all those times. So, you know, and wrapping up the presentation and moving on to questions, um, I just wanted to say that, you know, 
Um, I, before I met and worked with Austin, I had spent a lot of time thinking about independent development and structuring experimental gameplay. You know, you have to do your ideation and then you have to build a lot of prototypes and then you have to examine your game and test it with like real passion and vigor and then you have to throw away stuff that doesn't work. Um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about the proportions in which, the, which with the, these things happen, how the game uh, develops over time. I've seen patterns in development, even though every game that I've worked on has been different, um, and each team that I've led has been different. Um, I've always seen that there's a certain uncertainty curve and an effort curve um, that match the pattern of development. And towards the end, you always feel like you're going to see the light of day. If you can get your game shipped and not canceled and not kill yourself, you'll feel like you're really getting there. Um, but I think that what I realized this not in this process, a remarkably effective it's, way very, it's very, very important not to kill yourself. But the most important thing is that you also have to listen. Listening to the game and listening to the way that it sounded informed all of these other phases of development. And as much as I thought I knew, I really didn't get it until I worked on Journey with a composer and a sound designer who were on the game from day one. It just, it made no sense to leave the audio out and now I can't do it. I, I don't know if it's because we privilege what we see and do over what we hear or if that we're so afraid of spending the time and energy to iterate on sound because we think it has to be either perfect or that the concept has to be perfect before we can score it. Um, There's also a tendency to put placeholder sound and placeholder music in and then be like, yeah, that's functional, so it's yeah. fine, and then, and then they put it out of mind and realize, for, forgetting to realize that as with every other aspect of the game, you could be digging deeper with it and, and, you know, like, how many people just put in placeholder art and then just leave it that way until you're a month from shipping? I mean, that very few games ever actually do that because they realize the art is going to be one of the core parts of the game. But it happens with sound all the time. But, and, yeah. you know, I, I really think that what you hear influences what you see and what you do and therefore what you feel. And it's kind of crazy if you're going to be working on an experimental game, if you want to be giving someone new feelings, to leave out that component, leave that out of your design conversation is just, it seems crazy to me now. Even if it is expensive in the sense that it takes time and effort, like I don't think either of us would have traded this experience for a lifetime of other games. Um, in the end, it's the feeling that you create in your players that matters above everything else. It's at the center of what your game is and it's what makes your game powerful. And I really believe that that deserves to be heard. And we just wanted to say thank you for listening and we'll take some questions now. Oh God. Let's just start in the back. Right. Um, I often play multiplayer games with a friend of mine, and we're, we're together on voice chat, um, playing to a particular game. And at some point, like for example, a dragon comes up, and this very big orchestra music starts playing, and I'm <laughs> saying to my friend, "Oh, do you get this? Do you, are you listening?" And he's like. Huh? Oh no, man, I, I turned the music off, I'm listening to my own music. <laughs> I know him, he listens to very cheesy Dutch pop music. But it really frustrates me that people turned off the music like that. So the question for this game is, is it possible to turn off the music? And if so, does it give a warning, like, watch out, if you turn off the music, you are taking off half of the gameplay, because that's literally what it is. There's no, uh, there's no like, UI for adjusting the in-game mix between sound effects and music the way a lot of games have. So you're, you're muting your television uh, in order to, 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 to mute this game. Yeah. It's funny, and I have had a lot of debates, especially with Kelly, the other yeah. producer from Journey. She and I have had a lot of debates about um, like implementing, for example, um, you, if you wanted to like build in, I, like if it's a PC game and you want to build in like media, Windows Media Player, Winamp, or iTunes functionality or something so that you could literally score the game however you wanted. And to me as a composer, that's like, it's basically saying that what I'm doing is ancillary. Um, but at the same time, it's an interactive media, and I do acknowledge that I like the idea of empowering the player to have whatever kind of experience they want. Because if someone has a really emotional experience listening to cheesy Dutch pop music... Or Bob Marley, you know, come on. That's what people listen to when they play Journey, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. 
I, I don't feel like I should be there to tell them that that's wrong because at the end of the day, however somebody, if it truly is a piece of art and that's the goal, you want to create a piece of art, the, 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 not only is the meaning and interpretation of art very subjective, but the actual means of consumption of that art should be very subjective. I mean, some people like to, to put uh, you know, a Van Gogh print up in their bathroom and other people go in, to, the, to the Louvre and stare for three hours. To me, you can't make a judgment call on which one of those is superior um, respect for Van Gogh because in both cases there's respect being given. Yeah, I just went to see the exhibit here and uh, I was listening to Deer Hunter through the whole thing. So <laughs> yeah. that was all I heard was Deer Hunter. So in this no game tourists. you cannot in this game you cannot uh, you cannot do that. But um, but I even though I have an uneasy relationship with it, I am not against such things philosophically. Even if it, even if I don't want to be in the room for it, I, I can't bear to watch someone play a game. <laughs> and do that, but I want them to be able to. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Sweet Mudfin Dazen from South Germany. I'm a music composer. Uh, first of all, I want to say I love Journey. It's really one of my favorite games, and it's the first game that I actually could get my parents excited about, so thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, I have a quick question about the, the music, especially about the treatment of silence, because silence is obviously really important in such a game when you're supposed to feel alone, like, without music. Um, I was just wondering about your thoughts on that, about the treatment of silence, and especially how you come in with the music without destroying that, you know, silence, like, so the, initials, the initial start of the music. Yeah, that's always, um, that's always a really tough question is how you get into and out of music and then when you are... Most games seem to be deathly afraid of silence, uh, which I think is ridiculous because music is meaningless without silence. Music needs to be the antidote to silence and vice versa. There, I mean, I, you know, John Cage demonstrated to us that silence is just yet another form of music anyway. And so, um, Journey, it's always about the emotional context in any given moment. There are moments where music was artificially creating something that silence would do better. Or like, silence is not accurate. The game is never actually completely silent, except for that one moment that we're being very vague about, um, uh, where it crashed, <laughs> where it crashed for my friend, uh, that does actually get silent uh, for a brief moment, like actual digital silence. Um, but um, usually even just, you know, like I would work with Steve and, and, and we would, we would feel like, okay, what if it's just the wind? But then, of course, we would start thinking of the wind like a piece of music. We're like, okay, well, how, how fast is, should this wind be yeah. moving? How, how, you know, what direction should it be going from? And we start breaking it down parametrically the same way we would a piece of music, such that there's really never no music. It's just uh, like a curve of, of uh, emotional uh, intensity. And as for how we address like, when to start and stop, it was always just based on emotional justification. You know, if you're walking through the desert and out of nowhere a big full orchestra comes in, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Um, that would pull you out of the game. But if something like the moment in the, in the underground cave when, when the big creature comes up out of nowhere, obviously that's a startling thing. And so there's a, there's a musical jolt that is, of course, accompanied by a giant massive wall of sound design also. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's, it, but was, you don't question it. because There just, was a point uh, in the production late where we were, I was playing the game and there was a bug and the game got quiet. It was in the desert. And then I think we interpreted that because it actually felt pretty good. It was a, it was a time when the, the sound design in that area, the actual triggers that were creating the music was broken. And I remember calling Austin or writing him an email and saying, you know, I was playing today was. and there was, there was a bug where, you know, that stuff that plays when you're really on the very edges of the level was gone and I could just hear the wind and then when I moved back to the center of level, it played music again and we ended up incorporating that silence back into that level design because the, um, Kelly was saying that it was, it was really grating on her nerves, the constant soundtrack. She said, I feel like there is no desert, there's just the soundtrack in me. And we were like, yeah, we're not letting people have enough white space in that, in that environment. And I think that romance, that tender romance we were talking about earlier, there needs to be the, the alone time in order for you to appreciate it. So. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that there, the music tries to adapt to the interaction between the players. Yeah. Uh, to what extent is there something procedural going on there? Or did you just record it's many different versions? Many yeah, it's, it's never procedural. I have a very love-hate relationship with procedural music. <laughs> it's like I'm fascinated endlessly by it intellectually, but every time I go to write music and play around with things like Max MSP and other sort of procedural music uh, 
approaches, it, it just it never feels like music to me anymore. Uh, and because uh, to me, at the end of the day, everything in my life, which music is the spear point of, is about connecting with fellow human beings. And human beings make music, even if it's electronic music. Human beings do that. And so for me, it's like, for example, I got into a big uh, debate. At one point, Sony was going to take away my orchestra recording budget on this game. And I was like, guys, I've already written a bunch of orchestral music, and I am not going to ship this game with samples. I'm sorry, samples aren't music. Yeah. They are placeholders. And so if we are going to be having to, uh, use it, like, if we can't afford that all of a sudden, I need to go and figure out a way to write the music that doesn't need it. Because it can't be, because samples are going to be the lesser version of if we had afforded it. And that's holding back the musicality. Fortunately, they did end up justifying it. Yeah, uh, that was not going to happen. <laughs> but initially, yeah, there was a moment where it wasn't, wasn't going to happen. And so, and to me, like hearing 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 forty people play as one organism is procedural music. Just can't do that for me. And maybe that's just me. And maybe I'm just rooted in in. And maybe I'm just an old-fashioned person. Uh, but I have played around enough with it that I feel confident in saying that. But I do think there is a place for it, and I'm always experimenting to find that. But in this case, to actually answer your question, there's nothing ever. There's just gazillions of possible places that it can go. And, and something that's dynamically being sort of almost like remixed in real time to, to accommodate. Yeah, Monty Mudd and Martin Middleson did a lot of the sound programming on the game. Yeah, Martin was part of that game company, and Monty's the in-house uh, music supervisor at Sony. So I would create this Excel sheet that had it was like a thousand lines long of, yeah. of exactly what every single piece of music could potentially have happened to it. And I, that's why I play tested the game so much, because I wanted to basically try to be every player that would ever play this game. So I would try speed rushing through things, I would try, walk, you know, like, and I would, because I knew exactly where, like not every cue loops, but a lot of them are loops, but it's all interwoven so much that it should just feel like one continuous stream. But I always knew exactly where those moments were, where you're transitioning from one cue into another. So I would try things like, I would wait until one second before the loop would start, and then I'd rush through it to try to see if I could break the music and, and come in at awkward moments, and I would test every he was single iteration. the best iteration. tester of all of the sound I've, Yeah, I found a lot of other bugs that bugs. I would email them about in the process and be like, hey, collisions are screwed up over there, by the way. And Because I was testing to see every way that the music could be heard and to try to make it as a robust a system as possible, but always still feeling like actual music. Considering this is an indie game development conference, mm -hmm. um, perhaps affording an entire um, well um, company of music players isn't really much of an option for um, lower budget games. Um, would electronic music be well a good example? Of, uh, well, well, yeah, I, I'd have to say that Austin was incredibly flexible in working with us. Um, I don't think we could ever pay him for all the time that he spent playing the game and developing the sound on it. I think that one of your best resources as an indie is the passion of other developers who care about what you're doing. Um, if he had charged us for every minute that he was uh, finding bugs in the game, <laughs> we wouldn't be broke. Double the budget of it. Double the budget uh, of it. But also, I think he's capable of designing for small orchestras, working with musicians who are volunteer. Um, if the push had come to shove in the end, and we hadn't won the conversation about the sound budget, um, we would have had to come up with another option, and I'm confident that we would have been able to do it. I think that it is well within the realm of indies to work with other indies who can make handmade music, if that's what you think fits your game. Yeah, I mean, I have nothing, I mean, flow is 100% electronic music, yeah. and I don't have any embarrassment over what I did there. I, 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 to me, there's six types of sound-making um, families. There's woodwinds, brass, percussion, strings, uh, the human voice and electronics. Those are the six means of creating sound in this world. And they are all equals. Uh, and so I have no, no issue with whatsoever with electronic music. It just didn't fit. Well, actually, I shouldn't say it didn't fit Journey. Journey's loaded with electronic music. Yeah. It's just not like 8-bit chiptune type electronic music, which is what most people think of when I say that term these days. Um, but, uh, or something, a cousin of that to some degree. But obviously it's very, you know, organically, and a lot of it is sort of organically arrived at electronic music, you know, where like I would record an instrument and then I would start manipulating that recording so much that it nowhere resembled the original recording anymore. But to answer your question, first off, there's always a way. The key is to always be solution-oriented and to just, and, and you know, the problem is a lot of people 
think my time, as a composer, they think my time to be creative is while I'm composing. And things like budget negotiations and timelines and all of that need to be much more of this business-like conversation. I'm like, no, 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 your creativity needs to be a part of every single thing you do. You really should be thinking of creativity in terms of what you eat and the position you sleep in, and every single thing should be all one system. So that if you can't afford an orchestra, figure out why that wouldn't have been the best solution for your game anyway. And what you instead come up with is the perfect solution. Like, you know, uh, uh, I, 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 I did a game where, uh, like I'm doing one right now that I can't talk about, but we can't afford an orchestra, but that, but it was like, I don't, I don't, therefore I don't want to do an orchestra. Let's find something else. What if I just hire a kazoo player and just yeah. come up with five hours of kazoo music? That'll be interesting. Like, and you can afford that, you know, uh, or just- I have a kazoo. <laughs> yeah, exactly, you know? So to me, um, it, it only, you know, it only leads to more creative solutions anyway. Yeah, I mean, Journey was made with 12 people for the most part. Um, we had a few extra hands on the game, at, you know, here or there, but we started out at 7 and topped out at 12 when we, when we closed the, the team down. And I think that, you know, uh, we had to make a lot of economical choices about how we spent our time and energy. The design, the sound, the, the art, all of the coding, every aspect of the game came from our need to be lean and to be able to go longer because we needed to keep searching. And so it was kind of like a, a mission to the Arctic in that way. Like we were always trying to do the thing that was the most economical, but also would get us the furthest, closest to the point that we were trying to hit. Um, and I would really encourage all of you to, uh, to take from this um, techniques that will allow you to express yourselves and find the games that are in, inside of each of you. It's the, it's, the, it's the unique concepts. It's that little lightning bolt that's inside of each of you that we want to play. So we would, should probably wrap it up and just want to say thank you so much for having us here. We really appreciate it yeah, meeting all of you.